السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم <coughs> الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین شفیع المذنبین رحمۃ للعالمین مولانا و سیدنا اب القاسم محمد و علی علیہ طیبین طاہرین لاسیما بقیت اللہ فی الارض ارواح الہ الفدا و لعنۃ اللہ علیہ ادائہ مجمعین من الآن علیہ قیام یوم الدین اما بعد فقط قال اللہ سبحان و تعالی فی قرآن المجید بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قل للمؤمنین یغد من ابصارحم و یحفظ فروجهم صلوات علی محمد و آل محمد Respected elders, brothers, sisters Tonight's discussion is on hijab, mixed gatherings, mahram and na-mahram relationships It's a very sensitive topic as you can imagine It involves many things from looking, talking, dressing, appearing, friendships, online friendships, offline friendships, many, many things come into this category. Because our lives are now so complicated with modern life, with modern gadgets, with the internet, etc., with social media, that many, many things now come into this. <clears throat> so it's a very sensitive topic. And it's also a topic that's not easy to explain. So we'll have to go into quite a bit of detail, looking at certain concepts, looking at certain histories of what happened in Islam, how the Prophet dealt with certain situations, how the Imams commented on certain situations for us to get a good, proper understanding of this subject. Now, <coughs> whether we like it or not, Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Whether we like it or not, Regarding our religion, there is a very negative perception when it comes to women. You look out there, look at what the media says, look at what people portray, look at what the right-wing groups say, look at what the racist groups say. Here, West, everywhere, it doesn't make a difference. There seems to be a concerted negative perception on Islam based on the portrayal of women. That your religion, your Islamic religion, so-called religion of humanity and religion of equality and religion of freedom and all of these things, you guys are hypocrites because you keep your women very much kept in the home, hidden from society, cloaked in black. You make them wear all these different things, hide their beauty, hide their voice, hide their faces. Don't let them come out of the house. You don't let them take part in society. They're oppressed. They're kept backward. And because of this, you guys are so backward. You're barbaric. Your religion was fit for 1400 years ago. It doesn't fit in today's society. You men want to dominate your women. <clears throat> you men want to keep an upper hand all the time. Your scholars do not interpret properly. They, they interpret from a male-centric perspective. Everything in your religion is masculine. There's no room for femininity, for the woman, for the womanliness. And it doesn't have a place in modern day society. This is of course the challenge. This we've been hearing for a long time. Previous generations heard it, we are hearing it, the future generations will probably hear it. Unless and until we actually establish the proper narrative of what's going on. What we tend to do is because we sometimes don't have the answers ourselves, Sometimes we also get caught in this. We also feel, wow, yeah, you know what? This is a backward religion. How can we keep our women like this? What is going on here? Really does Islam want our women in 50 degrees heat in the Middle East to be wearing these black coverings which are so hot? Can't they take part in society? Can they not be their own people? So unless and until we get a grasp of this situation, and we say what is the narrative behind hijab and these things, 
then these things will continue to be spread and be spoken about. So when we hear these things, there has been a backlash. <clears throat> the backlash has come on three levels. First backlash is that hijab <clears throat> is a cultural thing, not a religious thing. You must have heard this. We hear it in the West all the time. So the narrative over there tends to be that this hijab is a cultural thing because Islam originated in the Middle East. Hijab over there started with the Arab women. It continued to move out in the Eastern lands first of all. So their women also because they come from an Eastern religion. By the way, when, when they say Eastern, what they're really saying is backward. Yeah, just for your own knowledge, don't be too naive on the Western ways. Yeah, don't be too naive. Read between the lines. Because Islam spread in these Eastern backward cultures, they also adopted lack of education and lack of civilization. So hijab is not a religious thing, it's a cultural thing. This is number one backlash. This is what they like to promote. That we would like to see communities civilized to come out of this dark age of hijab and parda and go into an enlightened age where women can do what they want and wear what they want and act the way they want. This is the first thing, first backlash. Second backlash is, this is sad because it comes from within the community a lot. That you people have misunder mis misunderstood and misinterpreted the Islamic teachings. Allah didn't want this. Rasulullah didn't want this. Amir al-Mu'mineen didn't want this. You people have come and you have misinterpreted and you have given us something which is really not what Islam is really saying. So they say, for example, hijab. There's no hijab in the Quran. Quran doesn't address hijab. This is not the way it was supposed to be. Modesty is something else. Hijab is something else. We will address that as well. <clears throat> Number three. This comes a lot from the sister side. What they say is, you want modesty, right? You want modesty? Fine, we will be modest. But why do we need all these strict <coughs> rules and regulations of how to be modest? Allow us, we know how to be modest. We will show you a way to be modest. Leave it to us. We won't be unmodest, but we won't follow these rules. It's incompatible. Inshallah, we will address each of these as we go along in our discussion with the support of Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The crux of the matter, the central point of the matter is hijab is related to the value of haya. This is the crux of the matter. Hijab is related to the value of haya. Haya itself is a human value. It doesn't exist in the animal world. Animals don't do haya. Humans do haya. Animals don't even have the concept of haya. Humans have this concept. This concept of feeling modest, chaste, shy, bashful. Certain things I won't do because it's not doesn't feel right, doesn't feel dignified. My honor is reduced, my dignity is reduced. This is haya. Haya is this value that Islam says is very important for each human being to be a proper, complete human being. He needs to have the quality of haya. This is the central thing. It's a value of humans, not animals, and it's a value of all free people. All freedom-loving, free people with free spirits, they will enjoy and they will practice haya. Now let's digress a little bit and look at culture. What is culture? What is Islam? Are they two different things? See, the way I like to say it is like this. Religion is your engine. Religion is your engine. Culture is your vehicle. Think very carefully what I've just said. Religion is your engine. It's what drives. It's the main thing. It's the heart of this 
car if you like but how it looks on the outside how it goes what kind of tires it uses what kind of bodywork it has what kind of color it has the shape of it is your culture these two things go hand in hand you cannot separate once i tell you dress in a modest way you will dress according to your culture here you will dress according to your culture in the middle east they will dress according to their culture in iran they will dress according to their culture in the far east the same in africa the same in the west the same so your culture and islam go hand in hand there are some cultures in the world which are naturally more towards haya than others this is a very interesting discussion i'll just skip it i'll just go on the surface level at the moment otherwise it's a very deep discussion you will find typically eastern cultures eastern cultures are more especially when it comes to dress code they are more into the concept of haya than western cultures look at the dress code just look at the dress code and you'll get what what i mean when it comes to arab lands what is the typical dress code even for men what we call dishtasha kandura or jubba yeah the long flowing clothing that the men wear why it's behind behind it is the concept of haya not to show you the body parts to have it loose to have it long you go actually into a middle eastern country you get one of these tailor made for yourself if you tell them make it tight they'll discourage you they'll tell you no that's not the way you'll say why they will actually tell you as they've told me because i've got things stitched there they actually say in this culture this is regarded as an aib a uh, a kind of a defect to show your body and to show the contours even for a man even for a woman look at indian subcontinent what's your if you could say a national dress what would it be shalwar kurta right same thing loose generally especially the part from waist down it covers those private parts front and back naturally towards haya and far east as well there's many examples but just think in your minds the traditional dress of the far east again they have these loose flowing gown type long covering dresses compare that to the west the western culture is typically tight clothing contour sh- body showing clothing contour showing clothing the curves are there it's generally tighter so you'll see that some cultures are more inclined towards this feeling of haya probably because of history probably because of values family values men and women values the religions which came into this part of the world they generally all promoted this feeling of haya modesty and chastity so religion is the engine but culture is the vehicle so the first thing to discuss is is it religious or is it cultural is it the fact that islam started in the east and therefore we have hijab if islam had come in the west would there be a thing called hijab we have to understand one thing the religion of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam is from day 1 until the end of time regardless of place regardless of time the values of islam are constant they apply everywhere all the time number 2 if it was cultural and not religious then the quran would have nothing to say about it correct but if we can find references in the quran for this then definitely we can say it's religious and not cultural so now what does the quran say quran like i said yesterday it's not going to give you a diagram It's not going to give you very, very obvious, in-depth descriptions about everything. Some things it will give you the bare details. You will then have to look forward, further into it. Ask the Holy Prophet, ask the Imams, and then you get your conclusion. 
So this is what Quran says. I've chosen just a couple. There are more, but because of time and stuff, we don't want to go into just a full-on Quranic discussion. Just a couple of these verses to indicate to you what the Quran says about hijab. Hijab and modesty, they come together, as I said. So the first thing the Quran does, this is in Surah to nur Surah number 24, verse number 30. Quran begins not even by discussing the clothing, first of all. First of all, it says there's a haya above clothing. Even without clothing, the discussion on clothing, there is the concept of haya. Don't just think it's isolated to clothing only. This is another mistake we do. We think, well, as long as woman is covered, that's it, done, job done. Haya. No. There's so many issues. Even after clothing, even after hijab and these kinds of things, there are so many issues. So the first thing the Quran says is attitude. Qul lil mu'minina. Tell the believing men, yaghuddu min absarihim. Keep your eyes down. This is a big problem. Big problem. In the West and the East, women complain. Some women enjoy the attention. Many women complain. They say, we don't feel comfortable. We go somewhere, we are stared at. Men are looking us up and down. Men are rating us. Men are giggling with each other, looking. I mean, what is this? This is animalistic behavior, yeah? So the first thing is, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Tell the believing men, keep your eyes down. Women don't like to be stared and ogled and checked out all the time. So attitude change. Nothing to do with clothing at the moment. Just the attitude that this thing in front of me is not a piece of meat. This is not something just for me to feel satisfied, to feel aroused. This has a dignity. This is a, this is a human being. I have to be careful in the way I even look. Islam dictates even where our eyes go, imagine. So, put your eyes down. Dhalika azka lahum. This is more pure for them. So again, it's, the Quran introduces another concept. Purity of the soul. We're going to discuss social things, but on top of all the social things, there's the effect on the soul. Because whatever you do, whatever you look at, whatever you listen to, whatever you touch, whatever sins you do or good you do, it has an impact on your soul. So this is the first verse. Tell the believing men that they have to keep their eyes down. When we say keep eyes down, what do we mean? <clears throat> do we mean we walk literally with the eyes down all the time? Well. You could get run over, you'll probably walk into a lamppost, you'll probably walk into women if you do this. Of course, it doesn't mean literally all the time, eyes down. What does it mean? It means avoid lustful looks. Avoid prolonged look. Avoid staring. Avoid checking out this woman. It doesn't mean always to put your eyes down. Yeah? It means that modest way of looking and, and interacting. Second verse, next verse, straight after this one. Now, <coughs> Quran addresses the women. People think that the problem of staring is men only. It's not. Because the next verse says exactly the same thing. Just it changes believing men to believing women. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Tell the believing women. يَغْذُذْنَا مِنْ أَبْسَارِهِنَّ they should lower their gaze. They should lower their eyes. They should also not stare. The way a man can, can experience lust and shahwat, a woman can experience. Same thing. Lower your gaze, lower your eyes, don't stare. There's not a piece of meat in front of you. You're not an animal. You're a human being. There's a dignity involved in interacting with other human beings. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Tell the women not to display. Now here, we are starting the discussion on the clothing. Tell the believing women not to reveal 
their beauty and charms. Except what is apparent. What is apparent? What is the definition of what is apparent? Very simple. Two things. Face, hands. From the wrist down. Wrist down. Anything above the wrist has to be covered. Anything apart from the face has to be covered. So you'll see many different types of hijabs now. You have the turban hijab, you have other hijabs, you have different types of hijabs. They have to cover from the start of the hairline to the bottom of the chin and the sides of the face. This is the minimum that it has to cover. Then Quran says, وَلِيَذْرِبْنَا بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ Tell them to take their khumur over their chests. Now this is interesting. Some people say, well, what does this mean? It means that you just need to wear something over your chest and that's good. This is a very shallow reading of the Quran, if we, if we, if we think that. There's a deeper reading. Our ulama have explained. Khumur was this thing that the pre-Islamic women already were wearing. It was something that they used to cover their heads. But instead of bringing it forward like a scarf we see these days, they used to keep it behind. So it didn't used to drop, it used to hang back on their backs. So what happened was the hair was covered, the head was covered, but the ears were open, the neck was open, and the top of the chest was open. Allah in this verse is saying, tell them, keep the khumur, that's fine. But these bits that you've put at the back, bring them to the front. Tie it at the front, not at the back. In other words, make sure your ears, your neck, your chest, everything is covered. Hence, even now, non-hijab wearing women in this culture, other cultures of the eastern side, where Islam has had some kind of impact, they will not maybe cover their heads, but they will wear something like dupatta over their chest at least. So at least that is some modesty there. So this scarf needs to cover the hair and come over the front as well. Modesty, chastity. Okay? So, they all already used to cover their heads, but Allah said, now bring that end of the cloth over the front as well. There's a Sunni narration. We don't particularly cite Sunni narrations, but this is helpful to un for us to understand that yes, there may be some relevance here where the Sunni narration state that someone says, I have not seen women better than those of the Ansar of Medina. When this verse was revealed, all of them took hold of their aprons, tore them apart and used it to cover their heads. <coughs> In other words, there was an immediate impact. People understood when they heard this revelation, they understood what they needed to do. Another verse now with Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Oh. The first verse we said regarding the clothing dealt with the head and chest. Okay, what about the rest of the body? What about the rest of the body? Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet, Kulli azwajika wa banatika, tell your wives and your daughters, wa nisa'il mu'mineen, and all the women of the believers, yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna, that they should draw over themselves their jalabib. Jalabib is plural of jilbab. Jilbab means a loose outer garment. Basically, chador. Basically, chador. In Middle East, we call it abaya. Uh, in Iran, chador. Here, I guess you use the same word, chador. Correct? So your chador, your chador or your abaya is your jilbab. What is the quality of a jilbab? It should be loose, it should be from top to bottom, except those things which are apparent. We said the hands from wrist down and face. So now a question comes. I am covering myself head to toe. But the clothing is tight. Does it qualify according to this verse? No. Because the looseness is another part of hijab. 
the contours of the body, the shape of the body should not be apparent. Now, some hadith. So this was Quran. There are a few more verses, but I won't go into them right now. I think this much is enough for a Quranic discussion. Some ahadith. First of all, from Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam. Someone comes to him and says to him, What about the four arms of a woman? The part above the wrist. See, sometimes our sisters, they can ask some very funny questions, yeah? They can say, my forearm, what's so attractive about a forearm? But they don't know how weird men are, I guess. There are things Islam has defined as what are the boundaries of hijab. So someone comes to Imam, the sixth Imam, and says to him, what about the forearms of a woman? Are they also included? Imam says, yes. They are included in the command to cover. Those things which do not have to be covered are the face and the hands below the wrists. So Imam confirms this. Now some other points for our sisters and for our brothers as well. But mainly on clothing is related to women. Because of the form they have, because of the attraction that they, they attract towards themselves. Because of the nature of a woman and the nature of a man. Because of the way Allah has created this world. He has created everything <coughs> in a very excellent equilibrium and balance. Everything is the way it is so that it can work and function properly. Some other points for the women. Socks. Are they wajib or not? Yes. Socks are wajib. Feet come into the covering required of a woman. Feet come into the requirement. Now what about voice? Yesterday we had said I'll keep you in suspense about this. The voice of a woman. Are we allowed to talk to a namaharam? Say salam. Have a conversation. Work with them. Are we allowed? Well, generally yes. You're allowed. Nothing wrong with that at all. However, there is a condition. For a man listening to the voice of a woman, it should not cause him to be lustful or to derive that kind of physical pleasure from it. For a woman, if she's speaking in her normal voice, it's absolutely fine. But let's say she entices her voice or changes the voice, makes it more attractive or makes, makes it more sweet in a way, this is not allowed. So when, for example, you hear a woman she is reciting Qasida, Marcia, Noha, etc. This generally is frowned upon. This is not allowed. Because naturally when you recite something like that, you have to make your voice sweeter, different. Not that you're trying to attract anyone, but just the tone of the voice has to change. So if a woman gives a lecture in her normal voice, absolutely fine. If a woman participates in a discussion, fine. If a woman gives her opinion, her expertise on matters, absolutely fine. You'll see in Iran so many examples where Agha Khamenei has seminars with women where they come and they share their expertise with him. So many seminars in the Hawza where the women are fully involved. We have fully women only Hawzat, Hawzas with the men as teachers. There's no problem there at all. So there are these few restrictions. Now, someone will say, so we have to go through all this trouble just for the sake of men not getting attracted to us. Is it fair? We have to go through all this trouble just so you people stay safe from sin. No, this is just part of it. And this is where I want to change the narrative. This is part of it, we can't deny it. But this is where we want to change the narrative slightly. It is not all about the animalistic side of men. It is also about the animalistic side of women. One beautiful hadith. This hadith, I'm telling you, if someone writes 10 volumes on this one hadith, it will not do it justice. Someone comes to the house of janab fatima salamu alayhi alayhi. Oh.
the man is blind the man is blind he comes to the house of Sayyidah she says wait I will wear my hijab and then come she wears her hijab and then comes someone says to her but oh lady the man is blind she says yes but I am not what an example the hijab, when a man looks at a woman in hijab, there's an instant feeling of respect, back off, be careful. And when a woman is in hijab, it has an instant impact upon her that I should be careful. I need to also take care. I need to also make sure that this society functions properly. There are always sacrifices being done. As a man, let's stand up and say, hang on a second, who said that we have to work day and night just to pay the bills of our house? That's not fair. The women get off lightly. No. Allah has given you certain things, has given us certain things, certain wajibat, and has let the women off. Some things they have to do, and we are sort of let off. Everything is in balance. Everything is in its right place for the society and the world to function properly, to promote human values to give people a sense of haya and modesty, to keep families intact, to keep the roaming eyes of people intact, to keep the extramarital affairs intact, to prevent the breakup of marriage, to prevent unwanted, sorry to say, pregnancies in the society, to prevent unwanted relationships, to stop people getting broken hearted that forever more in their life now they're depressed. To prevent you having four or five relationships before your marriage and now you're married to a brilliant person but you say you know what i just can't click with him or her because i remember my previous boyfriends or girlfriends all of this is done for a reason all of this is done on multiple levels we don't have to always reduce it to the animalistic side of people that's one aspect there are so many more aspects islam wants a strong integral family unit wants the kids to be raised among stability, nobility, dignity, honor. It wants people to remain chaste. There was one of the ulama. He visited one of the towns of Iran. When he visited this town of Iran, he was like a guest in the town. The people came and they greeted him. Salam, Hajjaga, how are you? This, that. They exchanged views. They you know, spoke about lots of things. Somehow the conversation went on to, someone said to him, there is a unique, strange youth in our city. Whatever you ask him, he has a Quran, he looks in the Quran, he gives you the answer. This Haji Aga said, what kind of person is this? I would love to meet him, let's go. Where is he? They said, yeah, he's not far, let's go. They take this Haji Aga to meet that youth. This Haji Aga is skeptical, first of all. I mean, you know, all of us would be, right? He's skeptical, he sits in front of the youth. So he says, look, I hear very amazing things about you. He says, Alhamdulillah. He says, okay, in that case, tell me, when did I arrive? Opens the Quran and says, you arrived on this day. Correct. So Ajaga says, okay, no problem. He, he could have known that by just the talk of the town. He said, okay, what day do I intend to leave? No one knows this. Looks in the Quran, tells him, you're going to leave on this day. He says, yes. Test him with a few more. Everything, open the Quran, look, give the answer, open the Quran, give the answer, open the Quran, give the answer. This Hajjah says, show me your Quran. Takes the Quran, looks at it, standard Quran, starts with Alhamd, Al-Baqarah, Surah Ali Imran, finishes with An-Nas. This standard Quran. So he says, tell me now, how? How are you able to do this? Hazihi a'amalukum ruddat ilaykum. These are your deeds being returned to you. Now listen. He says, Hajjaga, one night, I'm a laborer. I work hard, I do hard work, I'm a laborer. I stay in this labor kind of area. One night, in my accommodation, a woman came in. There was no one else around. She offered herself to me. For a moment, I was tempted. But then somehow, I managed to control myself and I got her out of my accommodation and I shut the door. That night I went to sleep. 
in my sleep rasulullah came allahumma salli ala muhammad in my dream rasulullah came along with amirul mu'minin rasulullah said to amirul mu'minin ali this young man took care of his chastity and modesty what do we give him in return Amirul Mu'minin says, Ya Rasulullah, you know better. Rasulullah says to him, I'm giving you this Qur'an. When I woke up, that Qur'an was in my room. Since that day, I don't know how, why, whatever I look, I can tell the person the answer. Hazi a'amalukum, ruddat ilaykum. This is the reward, one small reward. I mean, in the hereafter, what he'll get, only Allah knows. One of the sisters, she was a non-hijabi. She enjoyed the attention she got. She dressed in a certain way, she acted in a certain way. She enjoyed all the attention she got. Then all of a sudden people saw she's wearing hijab, good hijab. They asked her, how come, what happened? She says, you know what, I came to a realization. One day, I was just acting as I normally would, and a thought came in my mind. Now you can say this is tawfiq of Allah, a vision of Allah, mercy of God, whatever you want to say. She said, I saw a vision in my mind. I saw the day that I died, and my body was laid on this trolley. You know the trolley that they take to give the ghusl and everything? I saw my body on that trolley and I said to myself, why am I living my life for other people? Why? And from that moment something happened, something clicked and I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I want to live my life. Why do I live for other people? Do so other people admire me? So another part of this hijabic discussion is this. That Islam wants to move the world, society, minds, your mind, my mind, everyone's mind into thinking that this thing in front of me, this female, is not a piece of meat. It's not a sexual object. It's not there for me just to satisfy myself. She has a mind. She has a character. She has an inner ability. She is capable. But I will never realize that and I'll never get her to do that until I can look past her physical attraction, attractiveness. Elevate society. Elevate women. You don't elevate women by taking clothes off them. That turns them into objects. You elevate women, you give dignity to women, you give freedom to women by putting those things aside and highlighting their inner beauty, not their outer beauty. Otherwise, look at the world, look at the problems we're in. So-called enlightened Western countries. You know how problem, what the problems are? Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Almost in every field, there is an inquiry taking place. Historic sexual abuses of young girls. In sports, in gymnastics, in education, in the army, in many things. Historic sexual abuses of young girls. When you become a sports coach, I've, took a, I've taken a course on a sports coaching course. The first thing, one of the first things they tell you is safeguarding. <clears throat> safeguarding, what they tell you is, when you're training a young boy, when you're training a young boy, never be alone with them in a room where no one else can enter. They say never, it's not allowed. If you, are, if you have to be in a place with, a, with your trainee, make sure the door is open or another person is there or you tell people or you get the consent of the parent. Even the consent of the parent, don't just get it over the phone. Get it on text or WhatsApp. Make sure you actually say, if you want to give a lift to the kid, the kid doesn't have a lift home, for example, you live near him. Make sure you have a written authorization from the parent to say, yes, I agree, you can bring my son home, no problem. Why? We would say, don't you trust us? What do you think we are? We're all pedophiles. You don't trust us. You think we're going to abuse kids. 
They'll say, we don't care what you think. The harm that can be done by the one in a million pedophile is so bad that we would rather have a blanket rule for everybody. Same as hijab. Doesn't mean everyone's animalistic, doesn't mean everyone thinks like this. But the few bad apples we have to protect against them, yeah? The few bad apples in society, we have to protect against them. Because the evil is too great. Imagine a young, vulnerable girl is abused. How long does that stay with her? Will she ever recover? Will she ever have uh, a life after that? Inshallah she will. We pray for those who have been victims to this. We pray for their future, Inshallah. But you never know. They could be scarred. So the philosophy of hijab is not just the animalistic side. Please don't misunderstand this. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Fourth point regarding the women especially is the hijab. In the home, outside of the home. So what I've seen is, for example, outside of the home, it could be very good hijab. But inside the home, let's say you have namaharam visiting. It's good to have visitors, good to have guests, excellent. Inside the home as well, make sure the hijab is maintained. Hijab in front of Namaharam is a constant. It should be everywhere. Now the third backlash which I wanted to discuss. What about the argument that we can be modest? We don't need so many rules. Leave it to us. Leave it to us to define our own modesty. Okay, let's play with that for a moment. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. There are a number of responses to this. The first response is very obvious. Are you wise or is Allah wise? Are you going to put your wisdom in front of Allah's wisdom and claim you have more wisdom? Are you going to have that discussion with God that I think I know better than you? This is the first thing. Number two, if we play with this idea, then where does it end? I will tell you, I don't have to pray namaz. I can be humble and thankful and obedient without namaz. Some Muslims have done this, by the way, as you know. Some Muslims have said, we don't need this formal five prayers. We can just do other things. I say, I don't need fasting. Don't give me fasting. I can be more empathetic with the poor people without fasting. So remove fasting as well. Hajj, who needs to go to Makkah? I can, you know, dress simply. I can slaughter an animal. I can feed people. I can run around the streets. I don't need to go to Makkah. Who needs to pay homes? Say, I'm not going to pay homes. I'll pay 50%, not 20%. I'll pay 50% in the places where I want to spend. Not 20% of homes. Where will it end? If we start saying this, that I can achieve these things without the formal form of this instruction from God, then it's no end. Then it'll go, Ilah, MashaAllah. Then we will have a new Islam every few years. Because every generation will say, we can do it ourselves, we know a different way. So this is not a good argument at all. Like I said before, we are willing to do ibadat, we are not willing to do itaat. Let's be both. Allah wants worshipping, submissive people. Worshipping and submissive people. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sometimes it is even more sensitive in certain places at certain times. So this is the final thing for tonight. From our sources we have this one incident where it shows us that sometimes we need to take more care in these things. There was a young man, very handsome young man, who was traveling along with the Prophet. A woman, a young woman, yeah, I have to stress young, then you'll understand what I'm trying to say. So a young man and a young woman. A young woman came to the Prophet at that time and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a question. He said, Bismillah, ask me your question. She asked the question. The Holy Prophet gave her the answer. The answer had finished. Then the Holy Prophet saw that her eyes 
were transfixed on his face. His eyes were transfixed on her face. They were looking at each other. Young man, young woman. He actually took his hand and turned the young man's face away and said, Young man, young woman, I am fearful that shaitan may enter. So there are times where even you have to take more care. Obviously, there are times of a person's life when he's more into these things, more attracted, more things, chemicals going on in the body to encourage this kind of thing. So we have to be careful at certain times and places even more. I hope that's given us a, an idea of what we're talking about. We haven't even got on to certain things. I wanted to cover things like social media interaction. For example, girls and boys, are they okay to chat on social media? Well, again, look at the principles. If their chat is indecent, then definitely not allowed. And if it's to do with something necessary, then you can say it's allowed. But if it's just chatting, flirting, friendship, then it's not allowed. Ulama say you have to take a lot of ihtiyat on na-mahram relationships. Because it can twist and change in a second. And we've seen this, we have life examples, we have people we know, they've, they've unfortunately gotten into this kind of thing. It's very then difficult to come out of it. Inshallah, maybe tomorrow we'll take some time to talk about these things. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala al arwahi allati hallat bi finaik. O Aba Abdullah. Tonight we remember one of the most dear shuhada to Aba Abdullah. Mu'mineen, you'll agree with me that when you have a young son, when you have a young son at the ripe age, what a support it is for the father. What an amazing emotional, moral support it is for the father to have a noble, dignified young son. This son was the eldest of Imam Hussein's sons. His name was Ali Yunil Akbar. Imam Hussein al -Islam named him Ali. He named the Imam Zainul Abidin Ali. He named Ali Asghar Ali. When the captives were taken to Kufa in front of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, they asked, who is this? Pointing to Imam Zainul Abidin. He was told, this is Ali ibn al Hussein. He said, no, we killed Ali ibn al Hussein in Karbala. Imam Zainul Abidin said, he was my elder brother. I am the middle one. Ubaidullah says, does your father not know any other name than Ali? He named you all Ali. Imam says to him, if my father had a thousand sons, he would have named them all Ali. Such was the respect of Imam Hussein to Imam Ali. Ali Yunil Akbar, on the day of Ashura, was the heartbreaking moment for Ahlul Bayt. Because this Ali Akbar was the spitting resemblance of Rasulullah. They all used to say, whenever we missed the face of Rasulullah, all we had to do was look at Ali Yunil Akbar. People would come from far from Medina after the death of Rasulullah, and they would say, we wish we could see Rasulullah, we missed him. They would be told, go to this place. This is the area of Bani Hashim, there is a young man there, Ali Yunil Akbar. Look at his face. It will be exactly like the face of Rasulullah. Ali Yunil Akbar comes forward. The first of the Bani Hashim to be sacrificed is Ali Yunil Akbar. He comes forward. He says to Aba Abdullah, Father, will you give me permission to go? Aba Abdullah says, even if I give you permission, your auntie Zainab will not give you permission. First you go and seek permission from Zainab. They say when Ali Yunil Akbar came to the tent of the ladies, there was such a matam which happened, there was such crying which happened, that Ali Yunil Akbar, they say we saw him come out of the tent and be pulled back inside the tent. And then he came out of the tent and then the ladies pulled him back inside the tent. Again and again they said, Ali, we cannot let you go. 
eventually he comes back to Abu Abdullah. He says, Baba, let me go now. I have done farewell. Abu Abdullah does not even say yes. He just puts his head down and sighs. Ali Akbar understands that this is my father telling me that I have permission. He gets on the horse. He starts to ride. He hears something very strange. There are footsteps behind him. He turns back and looks. What does he see? He sees his old father coming behind him. He says, Baba, we just said Khuda Hafiz, we just said farewell to each other. Hussein says, Ali, you do not have children yet. You will not understand how I feel. They embrace for the final time. Ali Yunil Akbar goes out into Karbala. He begins to fight. He fights a very brave battle. <coughs> he fights a very brave battle. But the sun is too hot. The armor is too heavy. He is too tired. He brings his horse back. He meets Hussein once again. He says, oh, Abba, oh, Baba, do you have any, even one drop of water? For this thirst is killing me. Abba Abdullah, what does he say? He says, oh, my son, we have no water, but you are welcome. If there is even any moisture in my mouth, you can take it. He looks at the mouth of Abba Abdullah. He says, Baba, what is this? I thought I was thirsty. You are more thirsty than me. He then turns his horse and rides out into Karbala for a second time. This time he begins to fight. But the enemies, they wear him down. They say that the final blow which is struck to Ali al Akbar, which brings him down, is the spear thrown from a distance. This spear lodges into the body of Ali al Akbar. Ali al Akbar is forced onto the ground. But before he lands to the ground, they say that he was caught on the straps of the horse that he was riding. This horse began to panic. It began to ride with Ali al Akbar still trapped on its strap it rode into the enemies they say that the enemies then started to strike their blows on the body of Ali al Akbar and they struck they struck at him and they cut him again and again Ali al Akbar is now on the ground he cries out ya abata adrikni aba abdullah hears the cries of his son he begins to run to towards Ali al Akbar but there was a strange thing happening Ab Ab Abdullah Hussein keep kept falling down he kept falling down he was rushing to the side of Ali al Akbar but he kept falling down why was this they say because when he heard the cries of Ali al Akbar a darkness came into the eyes of Hussein he could not see properly and therefore he was heard to shout Aina Aina Ali al Akbar Akbar, where are you? Where are you, Ali Akbar? He reaches the side of Ali al Akbar. Ali al Akbar looks at his father. He says, Baba, I am not alone. Hadihi Jaddi Rasulullah. This is my grandfather next to me. This is your mother, Janabi Fatima. Your father is here, Amir al Mumineen. Abba Abdullah says, Are they saying anything? He says, Yes, Baba. They say, Ajilil Qudum Ilayya Hussein, rush to us. Come quickly to us. We are missing you. Abba Abdullah hugs his son for the last time. And then he laments. He says, O oh Ali, dunya ba'dakal afa. I have no more joy in this world. After you, my son Ali Akbar. Allah, 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 O oh Allah, give our condolences to the barga of Imam Zaman. O oh Allah, make Imam Zaman come quickly. Give us the chance to be in his army when he comes. O oh Allah, keep us united and strong in our community. O oh Allah, give us chastity and modesty from amongst the men and the women of our community. O oh Allah, protect our youths and children. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samil alim. For all marhumin al-fatiha.